Uh, it's time to introduce our first speaker, a man who's been called America's finest satirical novelist. His newest book is called Skink, No Surrender. Please welcome the amazing Carl Hyacinth. Thank you. And thank you, Jason. And it's great to be on a panel with uh, Mem and, and Jeff. I, I, um, I just have to share a, a Florida moment. Uh, it's uh, uh, LaGuard uh, West Palm Beach to LaGuardia on JetBlue. Um, it's terrifying to contemplate it's hour, but I had to f make that flight the other day. And there were seven dogs and an 11 pound cat on the same flight. <laughs> now, normally, this isn't one of those only in Florida things. This is why my books are so twisted. N normally, it's just an inconvenience to have that much livestock on a commercial <laughs> aircraft. But as we're waiting to board and the plane was delayed, a horrible shrieking sound comes out of, of the men's room. This is a true story. And I hear a dog barking and a young boy screaming at the top of his lungs in angry adult voices. And a man comes hurrying out of the, of the men's room in the airport terminal, holding a little dog and running very furtively, an older gentleman. And he's hiding behind the potted plants and he's darting away from the scene. And then a, a, a young father comes out with his son who he's got all bundled up and, and who has some superficial scratches uh, because this gentleman's dog, whom he, the, he had taken it into the men's room to try to get it to, to pee into the urinal. <laughs> had gotten off its leash and, 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 and so next thing you know, this is typical West Palm Beach Airport, we have the police arrive and the paramedics. The police have taken the suspected the canine off in a corner for interrogation. The kid's father, uh, lawyers are already arriving by the time we get on the plane. So I, I'm trying to put in context, the reason I mention this, and I, and I, and I am a dog lover, but the character I want to talk about to, to, today who's uh, in, in my new book, Skink, No Surrender, this character at one point in his early incarnation in my grown-up novels, um, he, he ate a dog, and um, it, it was it was it was rendered in a, almost a poetic way. It's not as disgusting as it sounds. <clears throat> but when I had to contemplate the idea of uh, of letting this character loose on the youth of America, there were these sorts of episodes came to mind. Skink. Um, First of all, I, I, I probably shouldn't be allowed to write books for young readers. And I, I, I've raised this issue with, uh, years ago an editor came to me and said, wouldn't you like to try to write a book for kids? And, and I said, are you out of your freaking mind? Have you, have you not read any of my grown up novels? <laughs> this is after st strip tease has come out. Um, you know, I just thought, no, but I had some kids in the family who were clamoring to get hold of, of books like strip teas, uh, my nephews in particular, and, and I, I do have some sort of sense of what's right and wrong, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a book that I could give the kids in my family that had the same sort of smart ass attitude, everything but take out some of the adult language, the scenes, the trapezes in the bedrooms, those sorts of things I take out of the kids' books. And, and, but just have something that they would, ha and then if the book bombs, it bombs, but at least they've got something in their hands, something that I can show them what I, I do for a living. So I wrote this book, um, a Hoot, which uh, really was just sort of ripped out of my, <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. I, I had a, a great editor, um, Nancy Sisko, and uh, she had given me the best advice in the world. She said, whatever you do, um, and she'd read some of the grown-up books, believe it or not. It, uh, and she said, uh, whatever you do, don't write down to kids. And, and that was the best advice you could ever give. Because they turn out, it's, they're the smartest, coolest audience of all. So I write this book, Hood, and then I end up having to write a few more books. And, and the kids, you know, I, I'm totally shocked by the result. But, but then I, I, I get this idea in my head in the grown-up novels, this character of Skink. Let me go back to where he came from. I, I had written a book in 1987 um, called Double Whammy, and it was about 
uh, sex, murder, and corruption on the professional bass fishing circuit. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was literary territory I had pretty much to myself at the time. <laughs> I was waiting for Updike and Cheever to, to dive right into the bass fishing world, but it never happened. Anyway, this is a little insight as to where characters come from. I was writing this section, I needed a hermit guy. I needed an eccentric guy who lived in the woods and was unreliable and sort of on the edge of the law. And I was only going to have him around for a couple chapters. So I invented this character and I called him Skink and I made him a former governor of Florida who went to Tallahassee, he was a war hero, he went to Tallahassee and, and, and he was overwhelmed by the corruption and one day he just ripped off all his clothes and ran out of the governor's mansion and disappeared into the woods. And I, because that's what a normal person would do if you've ever been to Tallahassee when the, when the legislature's in session, this is a perfectly sensible reaction to the Florida legislature. And, I, and he was just gonna be, I gave him that backstory and I thought he's just gonna be around for a couple chapters and then he's off stage. And yet, uh, he sort of came to life, he, he takes over this book on me, he sort of becomes the entire moral compass of this very strange novel. And, and I like him so much that he's elbowing the other characters off the page now, and he's starting to say and do much more interesting things than I had planned for him. So he hang, I hung around, and then I, I would, I since then have brought him into a number, a number of other novels and sort of dropped him in when things were appropriate, but. Um, my, my youngest son, uh, not long ago, he sort of reached the age where I could not stop him from reading the grown-up books anymore. I really didn't have an argument against it because everything that was in there, he learned it at school years ago and he thought it was being so. So he started reading the books and he found Skink to be a, a very entertaining and interesting character, as kids would. He's sort of on the edge of the law. And leaving the dog-eating episode out of it, he has good, good qualities to him as well. And I thought, well, why don't I turn this, um, I just give it a try and turn this character loose on, on young readers and see what they think of him. And I mean, I've, I, I edited, I've edited him, I have it described through the voice of a, of a young narrator, a boy, who edits Skink's language. And Skink has terrible language, he cusses all the time. And he, this has to be edited, obviously. And the, the, the neat thing about having the kid do it was he's telling you, now he's cussing again, but he doesn't tell you what he says. And of course, all the kids know what he's saying anyway. So it was a chance, it was a risky thing to do. And I, I thought, um, sort of selfishly, I don't know how many books I've, I've got left where he can carry them himself, and why not at least get him, you know, get him out there in front of kids and, and see what he has to say. The one mistake, that I made when I cre created or that his character came to me. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's one that I talk, when I talk to writing classes, I talk about this. When I talk to library groups, the same thing. And when I talk to young writers in particular, the, one of the first rules I give them is um, never write about roadkill. Um, <laughs> one of Skink's attributes is, and again, a little, I just wanted him to be eccentric, so I figured he's living in the woods so far from society. What's he going to live on? And in Florida, we have an abundance of roadkill because we have lots of highways and, and little animals get hit. And I had been inspired by this story about a Pennsylvania state trooper who became the king of roadkill in Pennsylvania. If, if a deer got sadly hit by anything, got hit by a car, they would call this guy and he would roll up in his squad car, put it in the trunk, and he had a whole walk in freezer full of roadkill at his home. And I thought, there, there's a hobby. Um, <laughs> so I had this clipped out, and so I sort of said, listen, my character Skink is gonna be a roadkill guy. He, he's what he's gonna live on, and you can live off of it in Florida. And so this is just like a throwaway thing that I put in the book, right? This is what, why young writers have to be careful, because you never know. I start getting, even for me, what I would describe as highly disturbing correspondence. <laughs> from around the country. I, I write a newspaper column for the Miami Herald. You can imagine what the mailbag looks like from that mutant demographic in South Florida. <laughs> so I thought I'd read just about everything you could read in a mailbag, but then the, the roadkill stuff comes in. First thing you get is the recipes. Uh, <laughs> you realize that this isn't a joke for some people. Um, this is, uh, it, I mean, this is, uh, this is Paula Dean squared, 
is what this is, the stuff I'm getting. And then there are people that are very enthusiastic about it. And then you get books, and they've written, there's a great book, if you're, if you're interested in this, and maybe after breakfast would be the time to do this. One of the funniest, <laughs> one of the funniest books ever written is a, a, a small book called Flattened Fauna. And some of you may know this if you're booksellers. It does exist. It's a guide to American roadkill, much like uh, the Audubon books are guides to birds and things. You literally can open this book and there'll be a silhouette of a splat on a highway and it will describe to you what animal. They have a whole section on why armadillos get hit so much. It's one of the great literary tracks in, in all of America about the poor hapless armadillo and what position they're usually frozen in and that last minute when they see the, the bumper of the truck coming at them. So this openness, what I'm saying is it opened a whole new world to me, not a, not a world you want to dwell in very long. Um, but it sort of hit the, um, it hit the low point or the high point, depending on how you look at it. I was at a um, book signing in somewhere, I think Waukegan, somewhere, and it was at a little mystery bookshop. And this was after one of the uh, books came out in which a skink appeared and a fan uh, showed up. And, and they, they were standing in the back and they were hiding something behind them. This is always bad at book signings. Uh, <laughs> this, was, this was before they started using metal detectors at most of my book signings. But, but there was something clearly being held behind him. And he, uh, he was uh, scooting up in line and I would sort of seen this and there was no security at this bookstore. But I said, okay, well, we'll see what it is. So he gets closer and closer. And he stand, when he comes up, and he's a, it turns out to be a very sweet and, and by all appearances a normal person, he presents me uh, with an oil painting of a roadkill that he had done just for me. <laughs> you know, this is, uh, I, and, you, and what are you gonna, you know, part of you is flattered in a really perverse way. It's, I mean, you, what do you say? Because I'm looking at it and, you, and, and I'm thinking in my own mind, now, how did this, unfold. Did, was, he, was he in his house one day and he hears this, the squeal of tires and brakes in the front yard and he, he grabs his easel and his pallet and he runs down to the road and sets up shop? I mean, and you, and I mean it, it, it wasn't abstract. It was, a, it was an honest to God detail. If, if I was an FBI forensic guy, I could have looked at the tire tread and said, oh, that's a Yokohama, no, it's a Goodyear 570. The detail was absolutely overpowering, and he was so proud of it uh, that I, could, I, I took it very warmly, and I, um, I have, I have uh, not yet, uh, 20 years later, found a place to hang it yet. <laughs> I have some relatives I'd like to give it to. Um, but anyway, that is sort of the world of skink, and, uh, and I just decided I couldn't uh, keep him away from the kids anymore. And we'll see what, we'll see what happens, and we'll see what the mailbag looks like uh, soon. Uh, thank you all for coming and putting up with this. I hope you finish your food before I start again.